The automobile is one of the most important inventions that revolutionized the modern world in America. The rich history of car culture runs deep as technology continues to shape the future of the industry. Jason Stein, former publisher of Automotive News, is here to share the stories of people passionate about cars, from industry leaders and innovators to car-obsessed celebrities. Buckle up as Jason takes you inside the boardroom, onto the track, and around the bend on Cars and Culture on Sirius XM Business Radio. Welcome to Sirius XM's Cars and Culture. I'm your host, Jason Stein. Some names in auto racing are just intertwined with success. Gordon, Bernhardt, Petty, and Kyle Busch. As race car driver legends go, there aren't many in the game with a name that's bigger. At every turn, Busch has rolled up the NASCAR wins. Add up the totals and compare the eras, and Kyle Busch's name rises to the top of the victory list. Sure, others may have driven on more tracks with fewer competitors. Yes, others can claim dominance in their own era. But in cup races, the Xfinity Series, and the Truck Series, Kyle's triple-digit win total makes him the leader. More than Petty, Harvick, Pearson, and Gordon. And he's only the third driver in NASCAR history to win at least 100 races in a single series. Frankly, Kyle Busch has just won everywhere. Not bad for a short-track kid who followed his successful father and brother around tracks growing up in Las Vegas. Desert Devils, pushing and shoving and making their way to victory lane one week after another. Sometimes running over the competition, sometimes running through it. Kyle Busch and the Busch family are synonymous with many things. Winning, scuffling, being authentic and honest, and creating a racing dynasty. Today, Kyle, now 38, is threatening to push that legend status even further up the charts. At the time of taping, he's second in the current NASCAR standings, threatening to make his transition to Richard Childress Racing and Chevrolet one for the ages. Just a year away from his 15-year relationship that ended with Toyota and Joe Gibbs, Bush is tearing up the track. A little more mellow and very focused on his own son's racing career, Kyle is making people forget the last couple of years and remember that he's got a lot of game left in him. He may no longer wear the black hat, but he's still very much in victory lane. Kyle Busch, today on Cars and Culture, talking about his winning season, his more mature approach to the sport, and his own future in it. Hey, I'm Kyle Busch, and this is Cars and Culture with Jason Stein. What a pleasure, uh, not only to speak to him during the season, but during a season that has been, um, frankly, rolling along for <laughs> Kyle Busch. And uh, I want to get to something you said recently, which is uh, that you're you're the 14th version of yourself. Kyle 14.0, you called yourself recently. But I'll tell you, you're number two in the uh, NASCAR standings right now, and you couldn't be happier. Welcome to the program. Absolutely. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. Thanks, Jason. It's been, um, you know, pretty cool ride throughout my career and being where I've been and, and the championships that we've won, the races that we've won and, you know, having to kind of do a fresh restart this year at uh, Richard Childress Racing with uh, Team Chevrolet and being being back over on that side. It's been fun. It's It's been a challenge, but it's been fun. You know, we've been working really hard about keeping ourselves up on top of our game and we've won some races this year. We've been competitive in a lot more races this year. So, it's been neat to just, um, you know, have all of that kind of come full circle and, and to continue to be able to have my ways of being able to run up front. I know that you know that you had it in you, but are you surprised at all to sit here now in July and to look at those standings and to see just a tick behind number one? You know, um, I would say, yes, I would say that I didn't expect to be where we're at right now. I didn't expect to actually be in the second or third race of the year and to be able to go out and score a win at uh, Fontana where we were when we won that race. So um, that all came on really quickly, but I'm pleasantly, you know, surprised, happy, um, you know, everything's been fruitful. So um, being able to continue to have the strong run that we've had as of late, we've had some good luck on our side, which is nice. You know, it's always nice to be good, but it's also nice to have some luck on your side, which has been a far cry from what I've had in, in previous years. So, um, you know, it's just, kind of clicking, I guess, if you'd say, you know, and I hope that it continues on and we can kind of keep that click going where we have strong runs these last seven races before we get into the playoffs, which uh, will be the remainder of our year. You feeling pretty young? Pretty young? <laughs> right. Like your younger self? Um, yeah. I mean, I guess just, you know, everything's 
after, I'd tell you after a race, no, I don't feel young after a race, you know? So that's definitely uh, wears on you as your body gets older and as you beat it up and as much as I've beat it up over the years. But um, you know, I, I would say that uh, that, that reset of the beginning of the year and that fresh breath of life, I guess you'd say um, has kind of been a nice pace of change and um, change of pace. And it's, it's brought on a lot of good fortune and it's brought on a lot of, um, you know, cool experiences that I probably wouldn't have had otherwise. You said when you came over uh, to RCR that you wanted to buy in, you wanted to buy into the team, you wanted to buy into the Chevy system. Um, and some might have thought that it could have gone the other way, that, that maybe they'd have to buy into you a little bit. But I've heard you say that you've had to intermix your experiences. Tell me a little bit about that. I would say the biggest thing is like, you know, you kind of come into a new team and buy into their way and their system and how they kind of go about it and how they do things. And, you know, um, where I was before with, you know, JGR Toyota and those guys, we've been really successful. We've won and competed for championships for 15 years. So um, the way of doing things over there is drastically different than the way of doing things at RCR. And so you kind of take the goods with the bads with both places and you try to make it all good um, being an RCR with what I'm doing right now. So, uh, a lot of the ways and a lot of the things that the Toyota guys did were, were super good. They're really smart. And, um, the Chevy guys are as well too. They've got some different philosophies and some different ways of doing the same things. Um, but there are also some things that they're not doing that I'm bringing to, to light. They were like, Oh, we didn't, we didn't even know this, you know, like we didn't even think about this. And so it's pretty interesting to just kind of continue to evolve and, and make sure that, you know, each, well, not each side. I don't care about that side now, but at, that <laughs> our side going forward is as strong as it possibly can be. And having a, a really strong and, and foundation to stand on will ultimately make your success at the racetrack on Sundays a lot greater. You said recently you're still pushing for a few things that are on your priority list, kind mm-hmm. of a, a, at least five, you said, to accomplish some of the things that you used to do in your yeah. previous team. Well, are we working our way down from five to four to a smaller number? A little bit. Yeah. I, I would say we're, we're working our way in, um, you know, we're going from five to four, nine to four, eight to four, seven, gotcha. you know, so there's steps of processes that you have to take. It's not just knocking one off, right. Easy out of the gate. So um, yeah, we, we've probably knocked off two of them, which have been really, really good. It's been really helpful for me to be able to see some of the same data, some of the same information and things like that, that I've been accustomed to that only helps the drivers be able to better prepare for the races and also better, um, you know, set up the, the crew chief's way of thinking through a race and how they can go about being able to get to, uh, you know, the best finish possible on Sunday. That first day, if you can take me back to that, when you came over to RCR, uh, I imagine given what you've accomplished in your career, um, you know, the, the word butterflies probably wouldn't apply, but you had to have a little bit of, you know, anxiousness coming in, right? Yeah, definitely. No, I, I would say so. You know, it just, it's like, you know, I guess when I, I've been, life is school to me, you know, like I didn't go to school, so I'm still in school. I'm still learning life lessons. I'm still learning schooling lessons, engineering lessons, whatever it might be. So, you know, whether I'm going from high school to college or whether I'm going from college to another college, you know, um, I kind of felt like it was my first day at school, basically being able to go over uh, to a different team and be with a lot of different people and kind of, you're going about the same things. You're competing in the same space. We race the same racetracks every Sunday. It is the same sport. Um, but it's just, like I said, it's one college to another. It's one way of a campus doing something versus another way of a campus doing something. So, um, you know, it was, and I still don't know everybody's name exactly, but, uh, you know, that was one of my first things when I stepped in there was, look, I need people's faces and names on a list and on, you know, an organizational chart so I can figure out who they are, what their job titles are, what their roles are, so I can equate them to the same people of what I've been accustomed to for the last 15 years. So I know when I need something and I need X, Y, or Z, I can go to person A, B, or C. What a great way to push yourself at this point in your career, right? Yeah. I mean, nothing's, nothing's ever easy. Trust me in our sport, this is uh, so cutthroat and so difficult and so hard, but um, you know, it's a performance-based business as well too. So when you're not performing, um, you know, you're always questioning why, you know, what is it? Is it me? Is it the team? Is it the cars? What, what's going on? So, um, you know, you look at everything and, and to be able to kind of take that reset and to be able to go with a new team and to be able to prove myself out of the gate, but being fast and winning races, 
I think that just kind of bodes that um, I still know how to do it. And it's nice to uh, be wanted and uh, be desired and, and to go out there and, and reward the way we want with, uh, with wins. We've had Mr. Childress on the show. Uh, he, he is a legend, as is Mr. Gibbs, Mr. Hendrick. What was it like teaming up with Richard Childress? And I know he said to somebody, well, you all don't think that we're going to get along because maybe we didn't get along in the past. But you said people change. People grow up. Yeah, no, for sure. I think, um, you know, the biggest thing there was obviously years ago we had a uh, a falling out or a disagreement on how a race ended and and my truck was crashed and his truck was crashed. And then a few weeks later, you know, his cup driver and me got into it and his car ended up crashed. And so it was just not going well at the time. So, um, you know, uh, I guess probably eight years, seven years has gone on by since then. I've grown up a little bit and come to a, a different space and uh, a better light. I think he's obviously an elder statesman anyways, but, you know, he's kind of uh, suffered some disappointments in in his race team the past few seasons and the past few years of just not winning as much as he was accustomed to back in the earlier days. And so, you know, we were able to put all that behind us, talk about it, go through and, and um, you know, really work towards the ultimate goal. And that's to be competitive and to win races and win championships. And so, um, you know, Richard's a an entrepreneur similar to me. I, I've got a lot of side business stuff that I do, but he also does as well. And his side business stuff that he does is all about his racing and being able to put back into his racing. And so um, it's real interesting to kind of learn more about his his day to day and what all he does and how busy he is and on the backside. But, you know, it's it's nice to have a lot of that same conversation and a lot of that commonality that we're able to just kind of go after uh, our different projects, but yet set forth focus on this project, which is us racing, going out, winning, and being able to do that right out of the gate. What did Coach Gibbs teach you throughout that journey, Kyle? Yeah, I mean, you know, the the journey of 10, 12 years, whatever, I, I think the biggest thing was just how to mellow out. Like racing isn't the end-all, be-all. It, it's not exactly. And I, when I'm a kid, when you're young, when you're growing up, that's all you know. You don't have a family, and then you get a, you have a wife, and then you don't have kids, but then you have kids. And it kind of changes you a little bit to kind of rethink things and that there's a, a greater purpose. But, um, you know, it, it's hard to understand that at a young age. You know, when you're young, you know everything. Right. Um, and so it, it's nice to sometimes sit back and listen to some of the, uh, the older generations and the guys that have been there, done that before you and to kind of understand and take that all in and, and get a good real good look at it and a good process of it. You've talked about the pressure that you have lived with for a long time and that Coach Gibbs actually had a saying, he said, look, it's, it's just about winning. You know, our, our performance on the track is going to dictate whether we're successful or not in this, in this entire, um, uh, experience. When you go and look at your, your, the current iteration of yourself, what have you learned about what he said about winning being essential, but also mellowing out a little bit? Yeah. Um, <laughs> that that's tough. That's, you know, you're, you're trying to diminish or tone down a fire or a light or whatever, that fire, that di desire that's within you, that, that makes you who you are, that makes you want to win. You know, when you have to, I guess, tone that down that, you know, are you, are you taking a fire out of a, out of a dragon who wants to go out and burn everything in its way, you know, and, and, and win, you know, competition wise. Right. But sometimes you're a dragon that is, that is burning everything in its way. You're burning relationships, you're burning bridges, you're doing that sort of stuff too. So um, I, I think it goes both ways and just kind of trying to find a better understanding of what that is exactly has certainly, um, you know, been beneficial for me over the years. And I think having a son and, and seeing, you know, racing and, and life and perspective a little bit differently has kind of helped change that for me, but um, it still doesn't change what I want to do on Sundays. And that's to go out there and win and, and know how to win and, and do everything that it takes to win. And, you know, how hard you got to work in order to make all that happen. Um, Cause this stuff doesn't come easy. Were you a dragon maybe too many times before? Yeah. My fire was too hot. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what though? All great athletes. I mean, Michael Jordan once said, I've never lost a game. I just ran out of time. Yep. That's true. And then, um, you know, I think there's that old saying too, where, um, you never miss a shot you didn't take or something like that. Right. I might not have said that right, but there's, there's another perspective to that as well too. So, 
you know, sometimes you got to step outside your comfort zone and, and take a shot and, or try to make a move or make a pass or go for a win. Um, you know, then if, cause if you have that right in front of you and you don't take it, then that's a race you probably, you know, lost. And also uh, it is said about many great athletes, um, and, and legends like you, the honesty, the authenticity, uh, you ooze that and you want performance, right? So sometimes maybe people don't want to hear what's authentic and sometimes they don't want to have the direct approach. You've always been direct. You've always been honest. You've always been authentic. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, that's a, that's a good with the bad. That's a, that's a positive and a detriment all in the same way, you know, being authentic and truthful and saying things sometimes people don't want to hear it's the ugly truth, right? Like, um, it's just, yeah, a process of it, but, um, and look, the, the Bush family, me, my dad, my brother included, uh, we've never been the greatest at being able to deliver message as well. So, um, <laughs> figuring out a better way of being able to do that. We, we, we were definitely not, uh, for politics, that's for sure. But, um, you know, it's been really cool to have that, you know, burning desire and that competitive nature and everything that you need to have, because it's drawn me to be who I am today and the success that I've had today. Um, are there definitely better ways that I could have done about it earlier on? Yeah, for sure. Um, but you know, you, you live and you learn through those lessons and, and you, you know, I think the greatest lessons are those that when you're down, right. When you've been beaten or when you've been down, there's ways of being able to learn. How do you not let that happen to you again? How do you not lose that race that same way again? So, you know, I've, I've lost a hell of a lot more races than I've won. I've probably figured out ways of not losing the same race twice. So I feel like that's a good thing. Well, Michael Jordan also missed a lot of shots too, as he once said. That's right. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Wearing that black hat, um, you know, you, you've said in the past, you know, you're a brash young punk when you come in, maybe that doesn't sit well with some of the other traditional drivers, but you said it goes in waves and as you get comfortable and you learn, and now these are lessons that you're also imparting to your son, you, you know, that sure it's a performance-based business as coach Gibbs said, um, but you don't necessarily have to wear the black hat all the time. So what color hat are you wearing now, Kyle? Well, I would say I'm probably still wearing a black one. Uh, that's my favorite color or one of my favorite colors. So, um, you know, but I, the, the light is changing on it where, you know, I was not well liked or, you know, uh, just not a fan of a lot. A lot of people weren't fans of me for a lot of particular reasons, but that's kind of changing uh, with with I feel like um, the authenticity and the sincerity of social media, things like that, with me being with my son, going racing all the time, giving to my family, all that. And, you know, I, I hear from my wife sometimes, she's like, you're away too much. You do too many things. Like you need to be home more. And I'm like, yes, I hear you. I, I agree. I want to be home more. I want to be with the family more, but you know, there's this thing that's called a job and, you know, we want to put bread on the table, but um, you know, that's changing the guard a little bit with the fandom where, people are getting a different perspective of Kyle and this year, you know, coming into a race team where I might not be being with JGR, like you're expected to win, you're expected to run well, you're expected to win championships every year. And so if you're not living up to those expectations, you're not making yourself happy. You're probably not making your sponsors happy. You know, you're just living dismal, right? Well, being with RCR, you know, fact of the matter is they weren't great. They weren't running great for the last couple of years. Last year was a turn towards the right way with Tyler Reddick winning some races and stuff, but I gave myself a little bit more grace leeway, if you will, where I'm like, okay, if we go run eighth, like that's going to be fine. You know, like if we go run 12th, that's going to be fine, but we've been exceeding that or running to that potential. And so I'm like, okay, cool. You know, this is good. Like we're, we're making and we're running where we need to be running. And so I'm, I'm happier with those results and taking into what's coming to me a little bit better. And so that's just showing a more positive light and a more accepting way of, of racing on Sundays. And I feel like people are appreciating that. It's maturity, isn't it? Yeah, always is every day. You know, every time I, I put on my pants, I feel like I'm maturing. <laughs> you mentioned your dad and you mentioned your family. And I want to go back to uh, making your racing names on the bull ring, Las Vegas, three eighths mile asphalt track, Las Vegas motor speedway. 
and uh, you're running against local hobbyists at the time. And, you know, your dad had kind of blazed the trail initially anyway, right? Tom was a mechanic at a Ford dealership, and all of a sudden he was running short tracks. What are those earliest memories for you and of that? Yeah, um, well, I, I think I was at the racetrack. I might have been two days old or two weeks old. I, I've never gotten confirmation from my mom, um, but it's one or the other. Uh, same as my kids, I guess. So, um, you know, to me, my earliest memories were my dad racing, obviously. He raced in uh, limited late models and then moved up to late models. And he was always kind of doing different things and different guys would call him and ask him to drive their cars and he would do it. And so, you know, it was always kind of cool to go to the racetrack every weekend. I was never allowed in the pit area. Uh, you always had to be in the grandstands because rules were different back then. You know, minors weren't allowed, things like that. But he was always fast. He was always competitive. He was winning. There was a year he won 15 out of 16 races and he was booed. Like he was booed a lot because the fans just didn't want to see the same guy winning every week. And we didn't have a lot of money. So it wasn't like we were out spending the rest of the competition. My dad was just outsmarting him and being better with his car and having an understanding of his car and a feel for his car and how to make it better and what he needed to do and what he needed in it to be able to be faster than the rest of the competition. And so, um, you know, those I, I remember just him winning a lot and, and always just that was instilled in me early on. And to me, that's what I wanted to do. And when I was a kid, when I started racing, I didn't win right away. And I was like, oh, no, I'm not I'm not good. Like, I'm not going to make it. I'm not like my dad. This sucks, you know, and then boom, a, a switch flipped and I started winning and then I started winning all the time and then I was winning everything. And same thing. I was getting booed and all this stuff, you know, so I was like, OK, this is kind of what it's like. This is, uh, you know, what my dad was feeling and and what he was all about. But it's about the 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 work you put in, the work ethic you put in, the drive and the, and the determination that you have and, you know, being instilled in it at such a young age and being in the garage at seven, eight years old, working on your own cars working on your brother's cars, you know, when he started racing, cause he started before I did, um, you know, that just gave me that, <clears throat> that fire and that desire and that passion to be able to want to go out there and do it. And you were on the dime as your dad once said, racing your brother at all times. And, uh, there was uh, just a little bit of competitiveness between the two of you, right? Oh, thousand percent. Yeah. We, oh, right. uh, we, I'm, te- I'm trying to think back. So we had a race one time where I was running for national points. It was a Friday night race and Kurt was off racing Southwest tour. So he wasn't always there. So he wasn't really racing for points, but this was early on. This was in my first year of racing. And so he came back to race against us one night and he was supposed to let me win. My dad was like, look, we're racing for national points. Kyle's close. Like we need to win. And so on the last lap, like he was leading and we were trading the lead back and forth. We were racing and dicing it up. And on the last lap, he, um, you know, he got to my inside and he nosed ahead of me and he beat me to the line by like six inches. And so, um, I was so mad. Like I was really, really, really mad, but at the same time, like I didn't know it at that time, but thinking back on it, I'm like, I shouldn't have been mad because he shouldn't let me win. Like I should have to earn it. But that was probably one of the best lessons I think I ever had was in that moment. The next night we raced again on Saturday night. The next night I went out and set fast time, new track record, won much won the trophy dash and started sixth Kurt started fifth I beat him to the lead getting to the lead through traffic and then I took off and I ran as hard as I could and he never caught me and I won that night and so from that day and age right there I was like okay you know um it's not always going to be given to you it's not always going to be easy you shouldn't expect things to be given to you you're going to have to work hard for them and so that was probably one of the first lessons of Kyle Bush that made me who I was that, uh, I'm going to be a pissed off race car driver and I'm going to go out there and do whatever I got to do to win. I, I don't care what I got to do, but the flip side of that story is my dad was so mad after that race because I ran super hard. This is his equipment, right? It's his cars, it's his engines, it's his stuff, but I ran the car so hard to run away and Kurt ran so hard to catch me. We lapped up to fifth place in the race. And so my dad was mad that we were just burning up his equipment. And, you know, so <laughs> that was another piece of uh, we didn't have a lot of money and, and we raced with what we had, you know, so we had to take care of our stuff. While you two were racing together in, in NASCAR years later, did your dad offer any advice between the two of you? No, there was actually a time in 2007 we crashed each other. Um, 
He mm-hmm. blamed me for the wreck for about 10 years. And then finally he came around and admitted that he crashed me in that wreck, that it was his fault. Cause I, we didn't talk for a, a year, a year and a half, Kurt and I, after the crash, we didn't talk at all. I hated him. And, you know, we finally came to somewhat of an, an agreement to disagree. And it was grandma. Grandma was like, look, I want to have my birthday or Thanksgiving dinner, one or the other. And I want you both to be there, blah, blah, blah. So we, we were there together and and we had dinner with grandma. So that was kind of finally when we started talking again Um, and our relationships calmed back and and we've been good since, you know, but finally, when he admitted that, that he crashed me, I was like, okay, we can be, we can be brothers again. But Tom never intervened in that decade and said, look guys, enough. No, well, no, it was grandma that did. Um, Tom, I think he's a competitor. So he knew, right? Like he knows we both want to win. He, he basically raised us to be these gladiators that go out there and want to kill everything in their path, you know? So, um, I, I, he didn't know, like he would talk to Kurt on the side. He would talk to me on the side. There were probably some things in there where he was like, just call your brother. Um, but you know how that is when, when you're always right, when you're young and you know, everything, you don't, you don't make those calls. Um, but it's, it's all come around and my dad has, has been around and has been a a presence of, of Kurt and I, our entirety in NASCAR. Brotherly love and brotherly competition, I guess. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. So who wins a wrestling match? I do for sure. (laughs) Yeah. I, I got him beat by about 30 pounds. So Okay. I want to talk about the special car that you've done um, with your father as well. And uh, it, was a, it is a 1956 Chevrolet pickup truck. And uh, he bought it for you when you were eight, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, somewhere in there, eight to 11. I don't remember exactly, but yes. Um, so he asked, he, there was a guy who owed him money. He was a Mac tool guy at the time. So he ran routes and sold tools. There was a guy who owed him money. The guy couldn't afford to pay his bill. So he asked him, he goes, okay, do you have anything you want to trade me? Like I'll take it in on trade. And so, um, my dad gave me a truck magazine, like a classic trucks magazine and had old Chevy's old Dodge's old Ford's, um, all this cool stuff. And he was like, Hey, look through this magazine, flip through it, mark some of your favorite trucks that you like. And so I did, I looked through it and, you know, he was like, okay, this is cool. This is cool. This is good. This is good. And he goes, well, which one's your favorite? And I pointed to the one flipped to the page. And, um, and so he was like, that's cool. Yeah, man, that would be, that would be really neat. Whatever he said. Well, it wasn't a week later and this truck showed up. It was the exact truck I picked out in the magazine. Like it was a 55, 56 Chevy pickup truck and it showed up and I was like, okay, cool. Well, not the exact same as the, the picture, right? So it wasn't the $100,000 truck that was all tricked out. This was one that was taken in on trade for $4,000 or whatever that it was. And it was a bucket, a hunk of nuts and bolts and metal and <laughs> rusted parts and pieces. Like it was not cool at all. But at the time I was like, oh yeah, that's cool, man. You just have these dreams and these visions of like what it can be. And so he was like, this is our project truck. This is what we're going to do. We're going to build this one day. And I was like, okay, cool. So every winter or every off weekend that we had that we weren't busy doing something, we would bring the truck out. We would work on it for eight hours, nine hours, whatever it was on a day. And then, you know, we'd put it back in the, uh, in the barn and, and we would just keep working on it. And when I got to big time racing, you know, it kind of got put to the back burner and nothing happened with it. My, da- my dad moved it from Vegas out to North Carolina where we live now. And he went ahead and restarted the project years later, probably 20 years later. And um, there's another story that when I moved to North Carolina, I didn't have anything to drive at the time. So I was still driving our old family suburban that took us to all of our races on the West Coast. It was a 1989 GMC suburban. And I'm driving this thing all around town, whatever. And there was um, a cross intersection. Uh, This lady stopped and to turn on this road, there was no light or anything, but I was looking off, not paying attention. And I, I hit her, I I ran into the back of her. And so I destroyed the family suburban. And so my dad was like, well, I guess this is the engine that we're going to use for the 56 Chevy pickup. Mm -hmm. So I was like, okay, well, cool. Some, something good from something bad. Right. 
And so um, he's working on the truck. He built the engine. He's doing all this stuff and getting it all ready. And then he got tired of it, didn't want to finish. So I sent it off to another uh, company that would, that would do the work and finish it. So we spent the money to finish it. And I've got it now to today. And I love it. It's one of my favorite vehicles. It's an awesome truck. It's super fun to drive. I've taken Samantha and Brexton to, to dinner in it. We go to the ice cream place with it. The eyeballs that you get with it when you're driving it down the road is, is pretty cool. You know, everybody checking it out, wanting to see under the hood. What do you got in this thing? You know, so um, it's a really, really neat thing. And it was cool that my dad and I were able to start it. Unfortunately, with my life and everything else, we weren't able to finish it, but it, it did get finished. But you finished it now. Yeah. How often yeah. do you drive it? I bet you I drive it probably maybe 100 miles a year. Really not a whole lot. Okay. Um, it does sit at home. It's at my house. I've got a five car garage. So it's in one of the stalls where, like I said, if we want to take it out to ice cream or whatever, we all just hop in as a family and we go. How much does it mean to have your son racing now? I mean, this has got to be just, I mean, talk about next, next gen stuff. Michael Jordan also said, I want to be the bridge to the next generation. You're providing a bridge here, aren't you? Yeah, definitely. You know, I, I feel like with KBM, Kyle Busch Motorsports, our truck series team, I've got three teams there and we're providing a bridge to a lot of young racers that have now made it to the cup series and are racing on Sundays. 14 of them, I think, uh, have come from KBM and, and have raced on Sundays, which is cool. Including uh, William Byron, who's now ahead of you in the standings. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. William Byron's one. Eric Jones is one. Bubba Wallace is one. Um, uh, there's, there's a couple others. Uh, Christopher Bell is another one. So yeah, a lot of, a lot of great kids, but um, you talk about Brexton and, and him and, and bringing on the next generation of a Bush uh, to hopefully come up to the, the cup series. And, and he's only eight. He started when he was five. It wasn't a great start, but he definitely learned a lot and has come a long ways and has listened to me really well on driver coaching and telling him what to do and things like that. And when he does what I tell him what to do, we win. Um, <laughs> we don't win all the races, but we win a lot of the races, which is, which is fun anyways. And so we've had um, a, a lot of great times going to all these different short tracks across the country and, and running hard and doing well. And, and he's been fast and it's been a lot of fun. One, uh, the really nice part here is that oftentimes you'll be at the same location, uh, for a race weekend, right? He'll be racing. You'll be racing. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Um, I try to plan obviously his schedule around mine. I can't change mine, but I can change his. Um, and so like when we went out to, um, Fontana earlier this year, uh, he ran a quarter midget race. Um, you know, when we go to Phoenix, there's a racetrack that's just north of the speedway that they run junior sprints and he goes and runs there. Um, there's a couple racetracks that we go to that don't really have something that we do that's close by. So he might stay home on those weekends or there's other weekends where he's racing for points in a particular division at a particular track and he's actually leading those points. So he'll stay home on those weekends and I'll go somewhere um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's really cool to have them still travel with me and be around with me a lot. Cause I don't want to miss my kids every weekend, 38 weekends out of the year, you know? So I bet you they miss maybe coming to five or six of my races. So we still get a lot of time together. Is it tough to be Kyle Bush's son? <laughs> um, yes, I bet it is. I bet you he doesn't, uh, he has to earn things. I feel like a lot harder than some others. Um, there was a race a couple of weeks ago at a track where he's racing the kid for points and that kid spun out another kid and the other kid who spun had to go to the back. But normally when you're involved in the caution, if you're the spinner and the spinny, they both go to the rear. Well, since Brexton is racing that kid that spun out the other kid for points, they let that kid stay in second place behind Brexton and that kid ended up finishing second. And I'm like, well, that's not fair. He was supposed to go to the back. So like that would have been a bigger points buffer for Brexton to have in case something happens to us, you know, but it's just stuff like that, that I feel like we're sometimes not treated exactly fairly, but that's little stuff. I mean, I, you got to let that roll off your back. It's kids racing. It's at the end of the day, what's, what's that really going to tell you? Um, you know, if, if he wins a track championship at a go-kart level or not, I just, I like it because I, you add it to the resume. That's, that's always what I kind of looked at when I was 14 years old and I was a kid racing, trying to make it, I had a whole resume built out of all my races, everything that I did, all my finishes, all that stuff. And even when I was younger, when I made it to NASCAR, I felt the same way still. I'm like, I got to build my resume. I haven't made it yet. 
you never know how long you're going to be here. So you got to make sure that you're getting all you can get. You've also taught him that winning is important, but it's not everything. And ironically, you've taught him to be a gracious loser. <laughs> yeah, with Brexton being a gracious loser, a little bit. Um, he's not a... <laughs> I'm trying. I'm still trying. He's not a gracious <laughs> loser. None of us are, but um, he's doing a way better job at it than I did at his age. That's for sure. So he's, um, you know, <clears throat> he's got a lot of buddies at the racetrack. I really didn't grow up with a lot of buddies at the racetrack. So he, um, he has that relationship with those kids and he also goes over to them and congratulates them on a good race or a good day or whatever. So it's fun. Let's talk a little bit about NASCAR in general and uh, and where it is now. And unbelievable, right? You'll be next year will be twenty years that you've been racing, which I, I find just impossible to to kind of fathom. But boy, has NASCAR changed in the last twenty years? It's changed a lot in the last two years, hasn't it, Kyle? Yeah. yeah, no, no kidding. It's I feel like you know people ask you, they're like, okay, think back, how much has it changed? And I'm like, man there's been so much change when what years were the bigger changes, you know, every year has always changed. It's, it's still the same thing. It's still the same circus essentially. Um, but it's different venues, it's different cars, it's different safety, it's different this and that. So, um, it's been fun though. I mean, I, I wouldn't trade it for anything. Uh, I've made a, a great living here. It's obviously been a lot of fun. I've, I've great, uh, gained a lot of great friendships from it too. So great relationships as well. And so, um, you know, it's, it's been good. Um, Did you have I, imagined? I've enjoyed it. It's, you know, I've had great success. So I, do I want more? Yeah. I, there's a lot of things I've missed out on that I wish I've had more of, um, but I've accomplished a lot too. Could you imagine having a NASCAR street circuit in downtown Chicago? <laughs> no, definitely not. That was a new one to me. And uh, uh, I thought it was good. I thought it was fun. You know, it was something new, something different, something we haven't done before. I was happy to come out of there with a strong finish in the top five. Um, I didn't run as good as I wanted to run there though. Like I felt like I was just getting beat, um, you know, lap time wise by some of the other competitors. So there's definitely some room for me to get better. But there's also room for NASCAR to grow. And you've talked about how you believe that international expansion is, is likely. I had the chance to spend time with the NASCAR team, Mr. Hendricks team at Le Mans and okay. garage 56, uh, recently, and you, you see what was interesting there is all of the excitement from the Europeans who were in attendance every time that that car went down the track and how different it sounded than the Ferraris and the Porsches and everything else. You really believe, right? It, there's international expansion in NASCAR's future. Yeah, no, I, I do. I believe it. I think that Garage 56 program was pretty cool. It was um, it kind of shined a new light in Le Mans and a lot of people had a lot of interest around the NASCAR car. So I think, I think anywhere you go, you'll see a lot of interest around it like that. You know, if you go to, I'm just making it up, Silverstone, an F1 track, you know, wherever the hell it is in Europe, um, <clears throat> you'll have a lot of big interest. You know, will it happen year over year over year? Maybe not, but at least you go over there and you run a race. It's, it's going gonna, it's gonna to pack the house for the first time. <clears throat> Let's talk about maybe what you'd want to do. Does the Indy 500 appeal to you? Absolutely. Yeah, it, it definitely does. I've, I've, tried for years to try to find a ride and get over there and go do it. But every time that I've talked to guys and different team owners and such, uh, it would be a third entry or a fourth entry or something like that, where it would not be a primary ride. So it would, it would be their lesser people, um, or they'd have to go out and hire people that to just bring on for one race. So like how good are those people really going to be? Like, it just wouldn't be a full blown winning effort per se. Um, and that's kind of always why it hasn't necessarily come to fruition is I haven't been able to find that top ride opportunity to be able to jump in something to go win. Um, but you know, you never know what'll happen down the road. I I'm only getting older, so that's not going well for me, but, uh, I I'd, I'd love to go. We talked to Jimmy Johnson on this program right when he started uh, racing Indy cars and, uh, it's, he admitted it's a huge difference. Have you talked to him about it at all? A little bit. Yeah. Yeah. We were talking about it. He, he, he basically said, um, you know, what we race every weekend are boats and that's, that's a real car. You know what I mean? Like it's a purpose built race car. So he goes, it'll do things. It'll do whatever you want it to do. It's all about how hard you push it to that limit. Yeah. Right. The amount of training and physical endurance 
yeah. uh, the lack of power steering in an Indy car also shocked him as, yeah, as he right. as he shared with us. How about these? Uh, let me let me run through a a, a couple of other um, uh, series or 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 vehicles, and you tell me whether you'd want to race them or and why. How about sprint cars? Uh, yes and no. Uh, I've kind of dabbled my feet a little bit in the micro sprints, which is a smaller sprint car per se. Uh, Brexton runs junior sprints, which is a step smaller than that. So I've never really done that before. So I really didn't know what I was doing when I got into the micro stuff and I was a bit rough around the edges, if you will, but I've gotten a lot smoother, a lot better with it. So yeah, I think a sprint car would be the same as that. So um, I could do it. Swamp buggies. <laughs> That's a new one. I haven't heard that one. Um, yeah, sure. Why not? I've, I've seen those before. It's, it's pretty intense. You have to have a navigator to tell you which way to turn and they're giving you the hand signals, you know, of which way to go. So that could be, uh, that could be crazy. How about off-road racing? I've done a little bit of that. I've done a pro two before, which is the rear wheel drive trucks. I ran at a close course circus circuit in, uh, Chicago and that was pretty fun. I enjoyed that. That was really neat. Um, but like, Baja thousand, like going and running the desert race. I think that would be really cool too. I would, I would enjoy that. How about, uh, for uh, we just mentioned it, formula one. Yeah. Same as Indy. I, I, I would love to go do it. Yeah. I mean, I think the licensing part of that is really tough. I don't know. It's not going to be feasible because you have to go through two years of gaining your FIA license and that's just impossible. And, and by the time that happens, if I did it today, I'd be 40. So, you know, what 40 year olds out there running an F1 competing with the big dogs, I would go test one. I think it would be fun to just give it a ride. Competing against the 18 year olds now <laughs> more than anything else. Yeah, exactly. Uh, w- one more snowmobiles. A snowmobile. Um, I'd probably skip on that one. That, that reminds me of supercross. I, I don't think I could do supercross. So I'd probably skip that one. In another life, what would you be if you weren't doing what you're doing, Kyle? Um, you know, I, I don't know, I guess if I was still interested in racing and cars and all that, like I am today, maybe I'd be a crew chief or an engineer or something like that. But, uh, otherwise I would say, uh, baseball, I always loved baseball. I was a good, uh, good baseball player, enjoyed playing little league, stuff like that. And, um, you know, so probably would have given that a try and, and tried to make that pro. I was just going to ask you who in another sport do you really admire and follow? I would say, you know, to me, a lot of my, uh, the greats, um, love seeing what Tom Brady's done, love seeing what Peyton Manning's done, Drew Brees, guys like that, uh, Brandon Marshall, um, you know, um, um, some other guys that, that I've grown up watching. Rod Smith is another one, um, you know, so it, it, a lot of good football players. I also enjoy – my brother's huge into baseball. I haven't really gotten much into baseball, but like a rod, um, you know, Bryce Harper, you know, Vegas alum there. Um, so guys like that are, are really cool to kind of see and, and see their success. How important is merchandise for your brand? You talk about doing a bunch of different things and you have a number of different companies, but how important is merchandise for you? Um, yeah, I mean, I would say it's not a huge deal. Um, I think we do it and supply it to our fans because they want it. Um, they want to wear your stuff. They want to go to the racetrack with your gear. And I, I love going to the racetrack and seeing everybody wearing, you know, the, the new eight hats and the new eight RCR gear and everybody kind of changing, changing teams with me, you know, it feels like they're changing teams too. Right. So, uh, it's really cool to see the swap over though. There's of course the kids and and others that are still wearing the M&M's gear, you know, and still being Kyle fans, which is great too. So I love that. Um, but, you know, it, it's not a, a money maker per se, you know, the, the retail space in our sport has sort of lost its way over time. The last probably 10 years, it just hasn't quite been what it once was. So um, yeah, I, th- I think we just do it for our fans and, and our hardcore fans. You also have a manufacturing business, right? Yeah, we do CNC work. So um, CNC is is basically machining um, a block of aluminum into a part or a piece or something like that. And so uh, we service some military jobs. Um, you know, we service a lot of racing jobs. We do a lot of stuff for Kyle Busch Motorsports in-house. You know, we've got some cool trick pieces that we make that we're allowed to make that we do. And so to have your own machines in your own backyard at your shop is, is really nice to be able to, you know, uh, go do that. So 
that's, you know, some of the, the outside business that we do, that's, that's basically the, the money driving business, the money making business to kind of help pay for the people that help pay for the work that does the stuff for the racing. Cause the racing stuff is, is so small and far in between that it's not going to sustain those people's paychecks, you know? So we add in some of the ancillary stuff. Let's finish up with racing. Mark Martin raced into his fifties. How long can you go? Good question. Um, I would say in a perfect world, I've kind of dreamt this up a little bit. In a perfect world, I would retire from cup racing when Brexton is 15 years old and I would go run a year of truck. I'd go run a full truck series season to see if I can win a truck series championship because that I would be the first one to have ever won in all three series of NASCAR, you know, the a championship, which I've won the most races across all three of those divisions than anybody combined. Um, so I would do that. And then when Brexton turns 16, him and I can split that truck where he can run the shorter track races and I can run the bigger track races. So for two years, because you have to be 18 to run the big tracks. So for two years, we would split it. And then when he's 18, he takes it over. And then when he runs it full time and takes it over and hopefully wins a championship, then he moves on. And then I'm out, like I'm done, you know, that would, that would be it for me. So that would probably put me around, I guess, 49, 50 or, or, years yeah. old. Yeah, sure. By the Somewhere time you're there. Yep. That's a heck of a plan. I like that. Yeah, that's, that's the dream. So I got, I got to make the dream a reality. So we're working on that. I, I got to have that life after racing plan. I, I don't have that one set yet. And if, if my cup career is going to be over in the next, you know, six or seven years, boy, the time is ticking. <laughs> Does he get a truck at eight years old? Uh, like, like to drive did? around the streets? No, like the, the the truck that your father bought you. Oh, 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 oh. Yes, he has one. Actually, I bought it back in 2004. I still have it. So it was the first vehicle that I ever made with real money that I bought with the real money that I made. So I still have that. It's a 2004 Chevy S10 pickup truck. And I dolled it up a little bit and made it look nice. And so when he turns uh, 16, that's going to be his first vehicle. Wow, amazing. Final thing, you sit today in second place, a new team, uh, a new chapter of Kyle 14.0. <laughs> um, what will it mean if you win this year? Oh, man, that would be huge. Um, I think it would be really, really special for me, um, bringing a legacy back to, to RCR, then winning a championship again for the first time since 1994, which was last one with Dale Earnhardt. So, um, that would be pretty iconic. And I, I, I would give everything to make that happen. You know, we were so close to winning the Daytona 500 this year. Um, uh, that's the only box that I have left to check in NASCAR that I haven't completed yet is winning the Daytona 500. So, I led on lap 200. The race is 200 laps long, but it was lap 200 under caution. So the race got extended to finish under green. So unfortunately, I didn't uh, lead <coughs> the last two re uh, the last two laps after the restart. But um, yeah, I, I think it would be a huge moment, um, and I would that would be pretty awesome. Never lost a game, just ran out of time, right? Yeah, yeah. Never lost a championship, just ran out of races. <laughs> <laughs> We wish you the best of luck. Uh, you've been an absolute delight to have on the program. Thank you so much. We're watching you the whole way. If you win the title, you got to come back on the show. Awesome. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. And uh, I'll, I'll vouch for that right here. We win, we'll be back. So that'll be really cool. Appreciate you having me on. Thank you, Jason. we we'll pulling for you, Kyle. Thank you so much. Right on. You got it. Thanks again to my guest today, NASCAR driver Kyle Busch. And to watch my interview with Kyle, go to the Cars and Culture YouTube channel. You can like and subscribe to see more than 100 interviews. And thanks for listening to Cars and Culture. You can follow us on LinkedIn and Facebook, as well as on Instagram at Cars and Culture SXM and on Twitter at Cars and Culture. I'm Jason Stein. We'll see you down the road.